Thank you guys so much for tuning in. This is episode 33 of Coaching Connections. <laughs> On today's episode, we have Coach Mike Lopez. Uh, he has his own podcast, uh, Creative Coaching Podcast. He does a great job with what he does. Uh, he's the head coach of Sunnybrook, athletic director, assistant principal, you name it. Coach Mike Lopez, episode 33, Coaching Connections. Let's get after it. Coach. How you doing, Coach? Good, brother. How are you? Can't complain, man. Just uh, just got home, got situated a little while ago. Good deal, man. How you doing? Oh, man, just uh, here with the kids, laying low, man, trying to stay out the streets and, you know, just about yeah. it, man, really, and just getting some more of my podcast stuff done, and yeah. honey-do list, all that, man. Yeah, so, yeah. So, no, nah, man, thank you for having me on, man. It's really a pleasure, man, and an honor. Coach Lopez, I appreciate you taking time to hang out, you know, talk life, talk hoops, and everything else in between, brother. I really do appreciate your time. Nah, man, I appreciate you asking me. I mean, this is uh, – I've watched some of your episodes and great people, man. I mean, solid coaches, guys I looked up to coming up in the, in the profession and just guys I admired, quite honestly. And uh, so to be part of that group, man, I just, here again, appreciate what you're doing for the game. Here locally in San Antonio, this doesn't happen enough. Yeah, and so I think uh, you you take your four running with it, and that's great, man. Well, I appreciate that. Let's talk a little bit about COVID. You know, uh, how has it changed your life, your daily routine? Um, what have you been doing to keep yourself busy during this whole time? And and I guess moving forward, you know, what, what are you doing? Because we have no idea what's going to happen, right? No, what are you doing as far as planning those? Well, what I learned about my family dynamic that is my wife and my three daughters that, that are living here right now and our dogs and all that is that uh, we got closer, man. And I, and I think, I didn't know if that was possible because I thought we were pretty tight, you know? Yeah. We were pretty uh, solid. And then I find out uh, as a coach, you're always busy, right? So like the constant idea or a theme of your job is time away from home. Uh, and my kids go to the same school that I coach and teach at. So, I mean, there's really no separation. Mm -hmm. However, there was more time now to talk about real issues and calm their nerves about COVID, uh, calm their nerves about this social injustice, racism. Uh, so it's been very productive. And I think it's in the whole mix of things that seems like it could destroy society. It's not touched my house to that degree. Like mm -hmm. we're not gonna. I just choose not to let it. So I love the fact that we're all spending time outside. Probably barbecued more than I've ever barbecued in my life. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and just you know, me and my wife, we've had more serious conversations. Uh, you know, so we're growing together as a as a couple. Uh, my parents. And so it's just brought the family together, basically. Yeah. And a lot of fun things, watching more movies, watching, you know, killing it on Disney Plus. I think we've watched <laughs> everything on Disney Plus. Yeah. I'm trying to, I can't, I can't mess with Netflix with my kids because there's just too much junk on there. But yeah, there is. Uh, Disney Plus is the, is the goal. Uh, everything is just, so it's been good, man. It, it, I, I wish I, you know, I've, I've had family members that have dealt with COVID. I recently had an uncle of mine who passed away last week. It's pretty tough, man. But, uh, all in all, I think we're getting closer to understanding maybe for us at least, our family unit, why uh, we, we're kind of experiencing this and, and how we can kind of make lemonade out of lemons. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to hear about your uncle. You know, my condolences. Appreciate that. And, and, um, and it, is, it is scary, you know, and we don't, still don't know a whole lot about how, what's going to happen with this COVID and yeah. is it going to come to an end? Are we going to figure it out? But uh, like you said, it's been really good for us to – slow life down yeah, and, and hang out with the family. You know, sure. um, like I said before off camera, you know, you know, me and my wife, we adopted two kids last year. So well, when they came in, we, we uh, first adopted them. They gave my wife maternity leave, her work at the Banks Works. At. So oh. she got the whole like nice. nine weeks off to just That's hang out with them and, and, you know, pick them up from school and, and kind of get to know them while obviously we're busy with work and the season. And then, and then COVID hits and now, from March up until now, you know, I've been home 24-7 with them, and it's just us three, you know, terrorizing the house and, 
<laughs> and, and uh, you know, but getting to know each other on a lot more, you know, uh, I feel like we've created a close bond, but, but this time yeah. has been real special, especially early on in these first yeah. couple of years of the adoption. So we've yeah. been able to really develop a, a strong bond, stronger than we would have been able to if, you know, yeah. we're stuck working with, the, with everything we do as coaches. So, you know, That's as great, tough as, as COVID has been, it's been a blessing in our household in that regard, okay. you know. Fantastic. Man. Let's talk a little bit about your childhood. Where did you grow yeah. up? What was it like? Did you have any positive influences in your life? Yeah, man. Uh, grew up on the southeast side of San Antonio, right down the street from Highlands High School. Southeast, east, almost right there at that border. Uh, so my upbringing was like Tupac said, man, although we had it rough, we always had enough, you know. And um, I never knew what we didn't have because my, my dad busted his tail every day. Uh, my mom did the same. Uh, so, yeah, man, we just had, I had the typical mom, dad, baby brother, baby sister uh, upbringing. My parents were my role models and to this day still are. Uh, great leaders in my community, uh, giving of their time. Uh, it's like that, that, that uh, Twitter post you did the other day, right? Compassion, mm -hmm. love, all that. Like that describes my parents in a nutshell. Uh, they help a lot of people. So my greatest influences were my parents growing up, and they st here again still are. Uh, and you know, just the work ethic, the grind, the uh, the just pe they're people persons. Like they care about people, they love people. They'll give you the shirt off their back, sweat equity. They'll mm -hmm. get in there and mix it up. Yeah. Uh, and they just love people, and I just feel like that's that's really how I was raised, man. I was raised to see people as just ways to just find ways to make their lives better and that's why I became a coach too because I felt like that was part of my calling and what I was going to do for the rest of my life so uh so yeah man that's that's kind of my family unit growing up um it's it's always powerful to have those kind of influences in our life you know uh fortunate it sounds like you were to have have parents like that and to yeah. set that foundation and, and I'm sure you've taken those lessons that you've learned and apply yeah. them to your professional life and, and your family life and everything you do. Yeah. So it's beautiful to hear, brother. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. But let's talk a little bit about your professional journey. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. you know, I know you're kind of a jack of all trades right now on your campus, but before yeah. this point, you know, where did you start leading up to now? So I, I started coaching at the age of 15, right? My little brother is about nine years younger than me. And uh, I say little, but he's 31 already, so he ain't little, but yeah, uh, great guy. Uh, but when he was four or five years old, we started CYO, right? My dad was going to be the head coach. I was going to be an assistant. He taught me how to work with kids. I taught him somewhat of the game. I mean, I wasn't super knowledgeable when 15 years old. Well, what the heck did I know? But yeah, uh, So that's kind of like where I started, right? And then I went to do some – we didn't call it, I guess we did call it AAU at the time, but uh, there was no formal, like, I guess AAU was going to Florida, all that, right? Yeah. That was AAU at the time, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, we didn't do that, but we played a lot in, like, uh, the Rohawk tournaments uh, and uh, the a AAS tournaments yeah. uh, out at West Campus and places like that. And I had a great, great group of kids, man. I mean... I had, you know, I, you know, Ike Rodriguez played for me a couple of times. I love Ike because I, I went to school with his brothers at Holy Cross. Then the Joe. And, and so, uh, is he DJ? Yeah. So, like, all, uh, I coached that. Uh, but at the same time, I was volunteering at a charter school. And uh, from 2000, I started, I volunteered there. I coached flag football, basketball. Uh, whatever they needed, right? Me and my dad were just in the mix because that charter school pre, uh, prior to that was a, a private school, and I had gone to that school as, as a kid until eighth grade. Then I went to Holy Cross, and so uh, just volunteered, man. Got off of work, the whole day of work, then go coach, volunteer coach. And there was no facilities, there was no gym. It was just a blacktop and or a big patch of grass for flag football with stickers all over it. Uh, and just grinded my way for about eight years, man, and just volunteered 
you know, day in, day out, rain, sleep. I mean, it never snows, but uh, <laughs> it was times that we'd be outside on the blacktop. And I remember, man, these kids are freezing cold and sweats. And I'm out there too freezing, but we got to get that working, man, because there's a game coming up. Like, I've, co- I've coached high school boys since the year probably around 2000, 2001. So I've just been coaching, at, you know, at the high school level for that long up until now. And uh, so we just, it was really, really authentic, genuine. It was as organic as it gets. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, so then from there, I I stayed with that charter school all the way up until 2017. Had a lot of success there. And, uh, you know, managed it while I was there, probably sending about two, three, about three years, I sent about 14 kids to go play at the next level as far as basketball was concerned. But, you know, I coached middle school, I coached elementary, I coached JV. I mean, I coached at every single level. It was just, I love coaching, I love people. And so that when I made the transition to Sunnybrook, uh, you know, where I'm at now, it was kind of like, okay, a um, little bit different, a little bit, uh, I, you know, just one of those things where I had to make a decision uh, what I was really doing and why I was doing it, like finding your why. And I, I found it even more so, and I and I grew as a coach, as a person, as a leader, as an organiz- or as an organizer. You know, because it, you know, coach, and you got to be organized to get to have success, sure. really often on the court. Like you have to, and was able to field the last couple of years some really good teams, send some more kids to play college ball, um, and got into administrative roles as an assistant principal. I've been an athletic director since 2008. Uh, so I've always had multiple roles, more award, multiple hats, and very comfortable in those roles. Uh, very comfortable. Uh, I, don't, I don't mind the pressure. I don't mind the stress at times. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's overwhelming because uh, I don't bring it home, that's for sure. But that's been my career in a nutshell, man. I mean, it, it's been a long, long career. Uh, but I love it, man. I, I, I'm positive I wouldn't change anything. Well, positive. you don't look you don't look like you've aged too much, so that's a positive <laughs> thing too, right? <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, man, I appreciate that. Nah, man, you know, the other day I, I found one white hair right here, yeah. and I thought, do I pluck it? Do I keep it? What do I do? My wife saw it, and she said, oh, what are you going to do? And I was yeah. like, nah, I'm going to leave it there. It makes me look smarter. You got to rock it with pride, man. Yeah, <laughs> got a rock with pride. Every time my beard grows, we got to shave because of work. But whenever it grows, I find more and more, it gets more and more gray, and it's kind of a pain in the butt. But whatever. Yeah, no, I hear you. You know, but it, like you said, you know, the organization is important, especially when you wear multiple hats to be able to balance everything, your time management, just everything in general. Uh, yeah. Having that organizational skills is crucial. And, and I've met some young guys that that uh, you know kind of lack that and try to coach them up in that area as far as young coaches yeah. go. Just because, I mean, if you're not organized, you know, life, life can be complicated. Yeah, and I was talking to a, an athletic director from a, a school here in town, a young guy. He was telling me how he just got the AD spot. And he was a coach there prior, but wasn't on full time. And he got the AD spot. And we were trying to schedule some games for my girls' uh, team. And uh, I just told him, hey, man, reach out if you need help. I'll help you out because he mentioned he was kind of trying to learn the ropes of being an athletic director, scheduling, officials, all that stuff. And I just say, hey, man, just reach out and I'll do what I can. And I just feel like that's our role as coaches. I mean, the the whole idea and the premise of your podcast is, you know, connecting with people, connecting coaches together. And I think that's so important. It, it even supersedes uh, professional development to a degree we can kind of cheat on some things because we're getting somebody else's input. And yeah. uh, because I remember when I started as an athletic director, I kind of had to find my own way. Didn't have anybody that I was the founding athletic director of that district and had to see, see oversee multiple campuses. And some of them weren't even here in San Antonio. Yeah. So I was trying to figure out how do I manage all this? Who do I delegate things to? And so I think all of us as coaches, we know, here again, organization is super key, but also learn how to delegate and uh, just really be, be helpful. Yeah. And, and when in all that, I think that's, that's what you're talking about too, is just helping each other. And I think it's really important. 
For sure. I've never, and I've never really seen too many coaches deny someone help. I said it before in other episodes, but yeah. and I, if I've ever reached out to somebody, they never told me, no, Marcus, uh, I'm going to keep that one to myself. Go figure it out. Or <laughs> ask somebody else, you know, everybody's always been helpful. You yeah. know, I think it's a beautiful thing about our profession for the most part is, you know, most people, men and women are willing to, to hey, coach, you know, I'm struggling with this concept. I got, this is my personnel. Do you have any ideas? Well, yeah, this is yeah. what we run. And, you know, it's not like it's, uh, some kind of uh, hidden recipe, right? I mean, basketball. Yeah. We still, we all steal from each other, man. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah. yeah, it's important, and I like connecting these people. I mean, this it's fun when I get two coaches that I've never met. You know, by the yeah. end of an episode of a podcast, you know, they're they're buddies, and you know, I'm gonna hit you up on Facebook, you know, and just all kinds of stuff. <laughs> so it's it's cru- I, I like yeah. what I'm doing with this. It's fun. And I appreciate what you're doing, man. It's good stuff. Let's talk about your podcast a little bit, uh, you know, what you're doing. Uh, I think it's important that, you know, there's no, like, there's no animosity. There's no hate. I just like to show love to everybody. You know, you got your own podcast. I, I, I'm not going to hate on it at all. I got nothing but love for it. I listen to it and, yeah. and check out some of the episodes. And so uh, I think it's important as people in the same profession that we just show everybody love. You know, I appreciate what you're doing as well. Uh, talk about Thank your you. podcast a little bit. So, like, to, to, to kind of piggyback off of what you're saying about showing love to each other, I mean, I've experienced my difficulties uh, back in what, six, 2016. They did a whole story on me on the Express News about how I, I have all these players from these different schools, and I had to get over it because I only really care about the people who live in my household and what they say about me. What, is my parents, what do my parents and my brother and my sister say about me? You know, that's kind of like – the deal like if you coaches out there man if you're getting in your feelings about people talking about you or even hyping you up like if you live off the hype then you're gonna die with the criticism so yeah. you really gotta learn to just kind of uh stick to your guns and so on my podcast uh I initially dude this is what happened like I thought I'm gonna do something with politics leading up to the 2020 election like <laughs> I want to start a podcast and just mess everybody up you know what I mean and just like just mess with people and see what kind of you know <laughs> reaction I get, but I'm glad I didn't because man, it probably burned down my house or something, you know, slash my tires or whatever. But uh, I decided I a, a, a guy uh, I remember the first time Coach Mike Peck called me. Right, he was uh, recruiting one of my players, and I see on the on my phone a text. I'm in the gym at practice, and I see a text, and it's. See, it shows the message, right? And it says Mike Peck at the bottom. And I thought, hold on, man. Like, I've looked up to this guy since he was at Finley Prep. Uh, he is like, he's like the guy. To me, he was and still is to a degree. And uh, so I reached out to him to be my first interview. And I thought, I'll just do this because I respect him. I admire him. And I want to honor him. Let's just see what happens. After that interview, man, I caught this bug. Like the first time you coach and you know, like, okay, here it is. Like, I want to yeah. do this. Yeah. I caught this bug and it was like, all right. Now to kind of backtrack, I, you know, here again, sending now at this point about 17, 18 kids play at the next level. I've met a lot of college coaches, ton of them. And so I thought, let me I have all their numbers on my phone. They always told me, reach out if you need anything. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, hey, you know what? Let me call these coaches. And let's see if we can do other interviews. And they just start lining up. And then I, I throw throw it out social media on Twitter. Then people start listening and people start referring other people. Then people start hitting me up that they want to be on. Yeah. And they actually had uh, Stan Johnson at Loyola Marymount University. Just got hired about three months ago. Well, I had Loyola Marymount reach out to interview him. And so to me, that was kind of one of those points where I was like, wow, people are actually listening. Wow. Uh, and I'm just always humbled by the fact that you yourself, anybody would listen because I, I do it because I love people. Like that's always been my goal is to love people, relate to people, uh, just know who they are, know their stories. So when I started it, it was really just to hear people's stories and everybody wants to, I don't know. I don't know about you, but I think everybody wants to see themselves on TV, hear themselves on the radio to a degree. Yeah. yeah. Like, like there's no, you know, 
get in your ego too much, but we all have an ego. And I think some people like that. And I just wanted to do a service and, and, you know, let people tell their story. So met a lot of great people in the process and continually, you know, just connect with people and, and in, in these zoom chats and these zoom rooms that I've never, I would never otherwise have a chance to be in those rooms and talk to those people and connect with them. Um, and it's just been great, man, because I, I kind of center my life around Christ and how he connected with people. So like moving forward, if I say I want to be like him, not just talk like him, not just say I'm this, I'm that, and actually live like him, well, then I got to connect with people. I can't just stay in my little four walls and act like I'm going to change the world. You know, I'm going to I'm gonna complain about the whole world. But I don't want to do nothing to change it, and I don't want to have to talk to anybody. Yeah. Like, nah, I kill that. Like, I really got to get to connecting. And so that podcast, uh, I have a player's podcast as well where I interview former pro players. Uh, matter of fact, I, I was able to get Travis Diener on. Mm-hmm. And so that was that's going to be an amazing episode to kind of put out there. It's just stuff like that, dude, that just, you know, the podcast has opened doors like that where I'm just, I'm at awe. Sometimes I'm on the phone with certain people and I'm like, wow. Because yeah. to me, coach, I've, I've always thought assistant coaches, college coaches are like rock stars. Yeah. Like, like the NBA coaches, yeah, man, for sure. They've got their place. And, but they're so, it seems like so unreachable, so unachievable. Uh, not that the college level is so achievable, but just those were the guys that would come into my gym and tell me their stories about their lives, about what was going on, where they were headed to. And every time I sat with them, I'd hear their stories. And I'd say to myself, man, you need a platform. Mm-hmm. And so when the time came, man, it's really how it happened. No, I, I agree. You know, it's just kind of the idea behind when I was starting mine. And I always kind of wanted to do one, but never never did. And mm-hmm. then I was sitting talking to my wife. I said, you know, like, we're, we're on lockdown. You know, why not? Right? Yeah. And Perfect so time. Reached out to the first few coaches. She, she was like, is anybody even going to want to talk to you? Are they going <laughs> to say yes? I was like, well, I mean, I, I don't know. People, hey. people, yeah, thanks a lot for the love, right? And then – uh. <laughs> It's funny because she was like, after the first one, I put it out, and she was like, "Hey, that was that was pretty good, actually." It was, and I said, "Well, nice to know that you believed in the whole, from the beginning, right?" <laughs> and uh, you had your back way back. <laughs> yeah, but she, uh, I mean, she said it with love, but um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, it was, it's the same thing, you know, just connecting with people and, and getting their stories out there, and and you know, I didn't want to confine it to just you know basketball, and that's why I, I I just kept the coaching connection not. No basketball centered because yeah. eventually, you know, I do want to. I got some football guys lined up. I'm gonna talk to and you know Great, some volleyball man. coaches and everybody's got different stories and perspectives yeah. and journeys and and you know there's just so many people out there and uh, it's almost never ending, you know. And so uh, the ideas are endless. And like you said with the players, I try to do the same thing, right? Try to get some players on, you know, because somebody, some coach along the way helped mold their life, right? And so get their yeah. perspective on things yeah. and so um it's yeah ben uzo man ben uzo was a beast man like he still remember, is <laughs> yeah i remember playing i remember coaching against him him and tony crocker and uh aaron tavitas has this had this league going on out of st gerard's for years and we would play against them there uh, it was a south texas hoop something like that and man that was just high level stuff man like really good he, he that kid was phenomenal I say Kip, he's a man, but yeah, you know, it takes me back when I saw that. When I saw that interview, it took me back to see him. I was like, oh man, and he's just, he's a good dude. He's just a humble guy, real down to earth. You know, when I first met him, and he was just, he wasn't like, hey, I'm I'm an Olympian, you know, you know, <laughs> whatever, right? He was he was just cool, real chill. And yeah. So we clicked that way, and so uh, yeah, to get guys like that and hear their perspective, and and he's done some D league coaching. And uh, he's been around the world. So it's always – it's just oh. fun to get get everybody's story. Yeah, for sure, man. Talk about some coaches that, that have influenced you that, that have um, – you know, you look at them and you look up to them or, or their style has influenced your style or whatnot. Well, I think early on, man, my biggest influence for, the, for actually, like, thinking about how I was going to structure a team was, uh, you know, Jerry Tarkanian with the running Rebels, man. We just run and gun press – get out and just you know even even rick bar uh would not tommy uh tommy penders mm-hmm. at ut as well i mean just that running gun style i don't really run that at all now <laughs> uh I, <laughs> I don't i did early on in my career i did 
but then I just couldn't put up with the give a basket, give up a basket, you know, take two. Like I, I wanted to be stingy. Yeah. I, didn't want, <laughs> I didn't want to give up baskets. Yeah. So I kind of killed that nonsense. And then plus I always build my, I always build my program programs and systems based on my personnel, not my own philosophy. But uh, I guess early on, like as a kid, that's what I saw and I liked. I saw that brand of basketball. And I liked it now. Yeah. Coaches like that I that influenced me to like go into coaching was uh, Angel Cedillo from Holy Cross. Uh, he's the dean of students there now. But he was my high school football coach. We won four state championships in a row. Uh, you know, led the I led the city in sacks three years in a row. Had a lot of success. He mentored me. He took care of me. He uh, was like a second father. So like I saw the impact he had and I wanted that. And so when I think about how I set up a team every year, I go back to the way he did it. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I steal from him like we talked about. Uh, but, I mean, as far as basketball here in town, man, I mean, I, I would sit and go watch Coach Dickey, Wayne Dickey, at, uh, down, down near me here at Sam Houston, uh, Coach Bernal. I mean, shoot. Like, That's representation. Just- representation, dude. Like, I saw him, he looked like me or my uncles. Yeah. And I thought, well, if he can do it, I think I could do it too. Romy Vela, yeah. uh, even Coach Soto as well. I'd watch him or later on, um, you know, just guys like that. Coach Boggess, I, I love the way he he ran his teams. Uh, Coach Wacker, I love I loved going to Judson, watching the game. That environment was nuts. Yeah, uh, And, you know, I remember going to camps, uh, to Buddy Myers camp. Mm-hmm. at St. Mary's and going to their games and watching them. And that my CYO coach who was my very first coach, uh, Tony Gonzalez. He was just, you know, phenomenal in how he, he was a referee. I don't know if you know, but he officiates still to this day. And uh, he, uh, he taught us all the rules first. Like that was day one, <laughs> learn all the rules. So, you know, CYO, you're playing, you've got probably some guy that's, just trying to make easy 25 bucks for that game. Yeah. Calling whatever, right? And we would we'd find ourselves correcting the referee. My biggest my biggest uh correction, I'll never forget it, that was like, was that a charge or was that a player control foul? I asked the ref. He goes, How old were you? I was shoot, 10, 11, <laughs> about 10. As I started playing at nine, like I, st- I started kind of late. And I said, is, is that a player control or was he, did he have position? And that referee would look at me like, what's wrong with you? Just go down the court and run. I blew the whistle. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, exactly, man. And so I learned then that a referee's never changed their mind uh, unless their buddy's coaching on the other side. But that's a whole other story. Uh, but, yeah, man, I mean, those coaches, my dad, when I was playing Pop Warner football, he he was he wasn't the you know the most strategic guy, but he was there. You know, other coaches I had in Pop Warner, they were Car- there was a one coach uh, named Carlos Valle. He was never my coach at my age group. He always coached the older boys, and he was also a uh, he worked for the juvenile system, right? And he worked with kids, and you know, seeing all these coaches that were in my life that that were actually in my life that I saw. I put together the styling of, like, say, Coach Dickey, uh, Coach, even Coach Bonowitz, Coach Boggess, Coach Bernal, taking their styles and then matching the personal part of it, the people part of it, uh, the, the, that kind of conglomerate of saying, hey, I'm going to take what he did, what these guys did great with us as people and take what they're doing right with the game and I try to come up with something that's my own. Mm-hmm. And so that's really what I've tried to do. And I'm going to say I've always done it because there's some years that I haven't been successful. Very few, but there are some. And uh, I feel like we won the whole thing, you know, yeah. because we had such a great family uh, system and the relationships grew and all that. So, yeah, my like coaching and that show, those coaches uh, really, really uh, influenced me. For sure. And you talk about Coach Soto, you know, it's it's a yeah. it's a huge, you know, positive on my end to have, you know, my superintendent and Coach Soto. Yeah. Um, he's the superintendent of our district. To have him as a resource and someone I can 
call or you know or hit or the game the game will happen the next day he'll call me and say hey you know let's talk a little bit about it what'd you see would you not just to have that basketball mind you know yeah. i mean it's it's uh you know i'm a little more offensive minded than he was he's a, he was a strong defensive minded uh, coach you know and so to pick his brain and to have that resource man it's it's a huge luxury you know i'm yeah. blessed in that regard for sure so was, was was great yeah no man i mean you're you're talking about guys who and they roll out the rack and they probably forgot more than we'll ever know sometimes, I think. Yeah. You know, like guys that just have so much knowledge and so much uh, leadership and X's and O's. And, you know, I always heard that saying. I think every coach can can take from it. It's not about the X's and O's. It's about the Jimmys and Joes. Yep. But these dudes also knew the X's and O's. So they put them in an, an elite status even though there's maybe they don't get the credit or the recognition they deserved at the end of the day it didn't matter like those who they impacted and influenced remember and generations will always remember them before that yeah no absolutely man did you see uh devin booker shot last night dude killer bro yeah, like killer. you know you got two elite defenders you know one helping and, and you still have the the ability to you know to uh to pivot and hit that shot that was that was beautiful that was beautiful and you know what i noticed like i've i've uh buddy of mine phil beckner right he's damian lillard's trainer right and they work on that stuff dude yeah. that's not like happenstance yeah. that's not like you would think oh man it has like of course the opposite team's fans are gonna say that's a lucky shot leche yeah. right yeah, yeah. It's like whatever but nah man those guys work on that they per- they work on their craft, and that's you see the footwork, and it's awesome. You see the footwork, and you, I mean, you don't just magically know how to do that, right? Yeah, yeah. you know, you're, you're right. It's, um, you know, and then I saw another post online talking about uh, <laughs> it was talking about you know, if you want to hit a game winning shot, you got to do it on Paul George. Um, and then it, <laughs> and then it showed like seven or eight times where he's guarding you know, a guy where he hits the game winning shot, but then you look at it like you know, to me, I'm looking at Paul George like, man, the for one, the courage and the uh, and the toughness it takes to be isolated. You're out on the island guarding yeah. the other team's best player with the game on the line, and you're not even thinking twice about it. Like, this is my job. I own it. And if he scores, he scores. Yeah. And most of the times in those videos, it was good defense. I mean, there's not much more he could have done. You know, yeah. the guys just, just hit ridiculous shots. Yeah. yeah, you know, so. I mean, what do you think about that? You know, I wouldn't have picked on Paul George. What do you think? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, Paul George, guys like that who have the length and the size, you got to pick your poison. If you're going to come out, dude might go by you. But if you study Devin Booker, not that I have to to any extent, but he didn't drive to the basket like that. And he wants that. He wants that, you know, 10 feet behind a three-point line shot. Like, that's his – that's who he is. He's that that dude. And so Paul George probably, I don't know, is just taking on that uh, challenge. Uh, I never fault a player for going out there and getting hit in the nose with a game-winning shot. It's the guy that just here again doesn't have the courage to get out, uh, put his hand up, and just kind of rel- just look at it and say, "Well, oh, no. that's the same guy who's not going to take the last shot either." Exactly. Exactly. And, and you gotta you gotta have that uh, fortitude and wherewithal that you're not going to win them all. Uh, you know, let Devin Booker have that shot and just move on. Next play, next game. You know, if it takes – to me, if uh, as a defender, if it takes that kind of difficulty in a shot to yeah. – he hits it, I mean, you can you can almost – you have to live with it. I mean, it's yeah. it was a ridiculous shot. It was, it was amazing. Yeah. And I mean ridiculous with all the respect in the world. I don't mean it in a bad way. It yeah, was just no. crazy ridiculous. <laughs> he could have had a broom and he still have made it. You yeah, know? so if that's the shot he hits to win, I mean, more power to you. You know, like you said, it takes a lot of fortitude to go out there and, and try to lock up, you know, the other team. Devin Book is a he's a prolific scorer. The dude is ridiculous yeah. out there. You know, I just want to put this out there because I've never said it. I just want to put it on podcast so it's out to the world. But, uh, you know, you brought up Ike earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it just popped in my head right now. But you talked about Ike earlier. It's one of is my brother, younger brother, basically. Love him, man. Love lived him with me too. for a long time. Yeah. During that time he lived with me, we're, we're playing the alumni tournament against each other and we're extremely competitive you know i mean that's what i love about guys like ike and just in the area we live in you know just the kids are super competitive and it never leaves so we're playing in this tournament and uh he hits a shot he hits a free throw with like five seconds to tie it 
And so they bring it into me, and he's guarding me 94 feet, go the length of the floor, boom, 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 hit him with a little step back fadeaway, you know, at the buzzer to win, right in his face. And we had been talking the whole game and <laughs> to each other. It's physical, you know, we're kind of barking at each other. And we, we rode to the game together in the same car. <laughs> you know, and we're barking at each other and, and getting in each other's stuff. And, and then I hit it, boom, boom, boom. And, it, you know, just see the look in his face like, you know. But <laughs> it's all love. You know, he, can, he contested it. I just hit a tough shot. It's all love. We were talking so much. And then afterwards, just like, hey, what do you want to eat for dinner afterwards? Oh, man. Right? You know, it's, yeah, it's all yeah, love. You know? Yeah. But I, no, I man, you, you talk about y'all's alumni tournaments, man. Those are strong. I appreciate uh, it. A buddy of mine, David Garces, he graduated probably 95, I think. Yeah. Him and his wife, Lori. And, uh, you know, that, that, that adds something to, to what y'all do as a whole there at McCullum. Like, uh, at Cross, Holy Cross, we have an alumni tournament that's huge for softball. Yeah, it is. And that classes from back in 60 something yep. to come in and just, you know, have a good time. And so those alumni tournaments really bring about a lot of pride. So I, I, you know, and then of course it's all for a good cause too. And that's even better, man. And uh, so, yeah, I appreciate what y'all guys do with that as well. Well, I appreciate you saying that, you know, and, and I just wanted to tell that story just based off the idea of competing, like you yeah. said, but, uh, but also I just wanted to put Ike on blast cause uh, you know, <laughs> on, on, in a public forum, I, I've, n- I've yet to do it. <laughs> uh, I, you know, as I'm saying this, I have the clip on my, on my video. I might just oh. <laughs> play the video as I'm telling the story. You um, could have, man. You could have nice broke down film or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love I guess my boy. <laughs> um, favorite basketball memories that you have as, as a coach or a player, it doesn't matter. Uh, two of them. One's super serious. The other one's super funny. Uh, I remember 1988. I was eight years old. My dad was – I was. T- I told my dad, I want to go see Michael Jordan, like, I want to go see him. He said, all right, let's go. The Spurs are playing. Let's go down there, see if we can get tickets. We didn't know nothing about Michael Jordan coming to town and everything being sold out. Didn't know anything about that. Mm-hmm. Like, it wasn't, we didn't know. Uh, my, dad, my dad, growing up, he was a mechanic. So, I mean, he didn't have a lot of money either to be spending on things like a basketball game, something we'd never been to ever. So it was my first basketball game ever. We go to the Hemisphere Arena. We walk around. We go to the ticket booth. They said, no, nope, sorry, we're sold out. And I got this kind of gloomy look on my face. And my dad's like, well, let's see if any of the scalpers have tickets. And they wanted $100, 150 which is ridiculous, especially in 1988. And so just, it didn't work out. We're about to leave. I'm just, I told my dad, let's just go, dad. Uh, it's not going to happen. This lady walks out in this big fur coat, all dressed up. Real, really, really fancy looking lady is my memory calls it because I'll never forget that day. And she sees us and she says, do y'all need tickets? And my dad said, yeah. She goes, well, I have two tickets and my friend was supposed to meet me here, but I'm, I'm actually Stan Allback's wife. I said, whoa, wow. Like, I didn't know who that was. I was like, oh, okay. In hindsight, you know, former Spurs coach. <laughs> yeah. And uh, she says, here, they're, I'll sell them to you 22 for both instead of you know, face value was 22 bucks. And we get the tickets. We go into the game. Man, I stood, I mean, I, it was almost like a concert for me. I stood up almost the whole time because we sat like right by the Bulls bench. Yeah. I mean, like we were on the floor behind the basket, like floor. And I'm just at awe. Like Michael Jordan is right in front of me. Like didn't even know who the Spurs were at that point. I was just like, wow. And so that memory just, it never goes away. I have a picture. My dad, because my dad always took a camera with him everywhere we went, right? Yeah. And so he had, a, he had his camera with him and took a picture of me standing up looking at Michael Jordan checking into the game. And it's just it's an iconic picture for me. And just I'll never forget that moment. Second story, I was coaching probably 2006, 2005. I had this kid, right, who was on the team. Last guy on the, last guy on the bench. There really wasn't any room for him. He probably weighed close to, no lie, probably was close to 300 pounds. Uh, good kid, though. Really good kid. Loved him. Like, his mom was like, please just, just you know, don't run him too much. And don't, you know, and so, you know, he, he thinks he's like a sophomore. 
And, okay, okay. And I'm coaching the game and I'm telling the yeah, come on, blah, 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 you know. And then I turn around and I see him eating a Snickers bar. And I'm like, <laughs> like what are you doing? <laughs> like some decorum, you know, hello. And he takes a bite of the Snickers bar and he looks at me and he goes, Oh, coach, did you want one? <laughs> That's great. It killed me, dude. Like, I was like, no, I don't want one. <laughs> he goes, my mom can get you one. I go, no. Mom, mom. Yeah, exactly. Coach wants one. You know, just stuff like that, dude. Like, uh, I, those are, like, memories like that were my fondest memories of my early years of coaching high school because at that level with those kind of kids, you just – you just coached and hoped you won or you were in a game, uh, you know? So it was just really good times, man. So, yeah, that's those two stories right there. That's basketball for me. No, that's great, and that's, that's hilarious. That's, uh, and I can see I just played it like a, like a Martin Lawrence movie or something. Yeah. Right? <laughs> a rebound. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, top three basketball movies of all time for you? Hoosiers. Uh, Glory Road, and I don't. I mean, I don't think I can say it, but I guess White Man Can't Jump because I rem- that movie. That movie made so much sense to me because we used yes. to go play at Pickwell Park, right? Yeah. And if you ever played Pickwell Park back in the nineties, you knew like somebody was either gonna get beat up, shot. The gangs were crazy back then, right? Yeah. Yep. And I remember a time where some dude was like, "I'll be back. I'm gonna go to my car and." It was real. Like, it really happened. It wasn't just – it was real to me. So, yeah, when I saw yeah. the movie, I was like, hey, wow, that happened. So, yeah, I mean, stuff like that. Like, so, that's why that movie stands out to me. But other than that, it wasn't very good acting. And- no, but it was – it's one of, the, one of my favorite movies of all time, hands yeah. down. Terrible acting in certain <laughs> spots, but – Yeah, uh, I could never show that to my kids. Yeah. But, yeah. It's funny. Uh, my son took a picture – you know, leaning on 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 the hoop, I was me and my dad were putting together outside, and he uh, he looked like Billy Hoyle, and uh, he was kind of dressed like him. So then I took him and I photoshopped him and I put in a picture with those guys. Oh, it's, it's great! I'll send it to you later. <laughs> it's That's good, man. It's funny you say that though about Pico, because I I played out there before when I was younger, and it could yeah. be like that. You know, you see some crazy things, and or even here on the south, you know, at at Mary Park or at Sussex, you know, I I seen you know. I didn't know Jim. Yeah, yeah, right, right out there uh, at Sussex, and it, we call it Sussex. Um, but uh, you know, I seen I seen a a guy stop. He fouled some other guy, and I was probably like seventeen or sixteen or even younger, maybe. And these are grown men we're playing with, and he he got into a, with a guy that fouled him too hard, so he pulled out a knife, and the other guy didn't have a weapon, so he got his bicycle. So the one guy fought the guy with a with a knife versus a bicycle. It was the craziest thing. I've, one of the crazy, weirdest things I've ever seen. Yeah, you know that, that that brings up one more story if you don't mind. Like I was uh, me and my best friend, right? We were playing at Douglas Middle School or Doug, Douglas Elementary, right there by the dome, right? Because all my most of a lot of my friends live on the east east side, right? And yeah. so we walk from his house to go play ball over there almost every day in the summer. And uh, this leader of a gang was leaning up against the basketball goal. And I had a brand new basketball, beautiful NBA basketball that one of my cousins gave me. And he goes, hey, man, let me see your ball. And I was like, okay, you know, just dumb. Like, here you go. And then it, came, it was just so surreal because my buddy was like, nah, man, that's so-and-so. And I was like, nah, okay. And he was probably like 25 years old. He was in his 20s. Yeah. And he goes, man, that's a nice ball. And uh, and I said, he gave it back to me. And I go, thank you. And I go, thank you, sir. And he goes, you're a little respectful, MF, aren't you? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> dude, completely. Ha- once I mean, you have these experiences as a kid. You don't realize the trouble you're putting yourself into. Like, naive. You know, naive. Just naive, and just wanted to hoop and. You know, it's beautiful. It was like an official NBA basketball. Yeah. Beautiful basketball. I don't know what in the world convinced me to take that out there. but So, yeah, those three stories, dude, like. You, you almost didn't get it back. No, I'm, I thought I wasn't. I wasn't. I, I really thought, like, nah, this ain't happening. I'm not going to get it back. He'll kill me or shoot me or something. I don't know. Well, That's really. 
If you say no, you're in the same boat, right? Can I see the ball? Like, no. <laughs> just gonna, you're going to get a tick anyway. Yeah, one way or the other. <laughs> Man. Um, you think back uh, – no, I'm just going to ask you some, a couple random questions. You think back to uh, to some players in the league or wherever, you know, you see a couple signature moves. You know, what have been a, a couple of your favorite that you see that, that stand out, you know, like an MJ fadeaway or whatever? Yeah, the, the, the MJ mid-range – Spin, fadeaway, that's that's deadly. Like Kobe perfected it too and made a career out of it. So that's that's one of them uh, since you tossed it up. Uh, the other one would be uh, I used to love watching Jason Williams run the point. Oh, yeah. Like, like white chocolate Jason Williams. <laughs> yeah. And just the way he would just – like he wasn't the quickest dude. But I think he still probably stole from Hardaway, Tim Hardaway. So I would really give Tim Hardaway the credit because credit, that crossover was deadly, man. It was hard and it was fast. You took and he was going low with it. And you so because the crossover was my bread and butter. I was, I'm not a lefty, but I always went to the left. And I'd score 30, 40 points just going to the left on layups with yeah. that crossover. And so I think that's probably the move of all moves for me. Is, I don't think kids use it enough no. for nowadays. Uh, Cause they don't have usually don't have the explosiveness, so I think that's probably why they don't get low enough for the most part. But that move right there, man, that was Tim Hardaway used to be real low with it too. Yeah, yeah, because he he was like a little football player out there, just yeah. right, little, little bull. So yeah, those uh, that move, the Jordan move, and the Hakeem, man, the Hakeem, the dream shake. Like I saw him dismantle David Robinson in the playoffs. Yeah, and this was like what you know. You know, David, at that time, David was my idol. That was my hero. Yeah, and I'm I'm, I'm looking like what's going on? You know, it's uh, Hakeem Olajuwon. That dream shake was beautiful, man. It's, it's crazy stuff, man. But uh, yeah, those moves, man. Those are those are great moves, man. Like I think uh, you know, we I do I do enough player development. I won't say I do a whole lot. Um, not as much as I used to do early on. But I do some, and, you know, I, lo- I guess I love the Euro step when it works. Yeah. But not when they're running into people, which you see a lot of. Like, I have a problem with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, simple stuff on them footwork. Everything's footwork. The Jordan move is footwork. The dream shake is a lot of footwork. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, that's a lost art, man. Like, one kids the, in their footwork. One of the most beautiful videos I've ever seen from a – pure basketball standpoint was watching – this is an old video I watched a long time ago. But it was watching Hakeem Olajuwon work with Carmelo Anthony mm-hmm. on, on some mid-range footwork stuff. And, you know, and I showed it to my kids and, and so that, uh, from time to time. And you see Melo look like he's kind of doing what, what Hakeem is doing, but not really. So Hakeem is yeah. stopping him and correcting him every time and correcting him and correcting him. And you see the frustration yeah. in, in Melo, who's a, already a, a – all-star a few times over, uh, yeah. scoring 30 points a game in the NBA, still trying to fix the little intricacies of getting those moves right. And I thought, yeah. man, that is great for kids to see. You know, now will yeah. kids sit and watch a video like that nowadays? Probably not. I don't know. But, you know, for me, from a pure basketball standpoint, it was beautiful to watch. You know, yeah. 15 minutes of just those two working little mid-range, mid-post moves. Yeah, and Melo needed that and still needs it because he's not quicker than anyone. Yeah. You know, he couldn't beat his own shadow to yeah. the basket. So, like, he has the size. So, if he can get his footwork down, you know, at that time, maybe now it's probably – he could still implement it, I'm sure. But, you know, I think that's just humbling yourself to learn more when you're already great. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, I always relate it back to coaches, like, I don't care how much you, how many games you won, how hot you think you are, how good everybody tells you you are. Everybody just praises you when you walk in the room. Uh, you still can learn, and you can yes. still get better. Even you know, I uh, heard this one saying. It said something like, uh, "Just because it isn't broke doesn't mean it can't get better." Yeah. And so I think that's kind of the idea is like, you know, humbling yourself to get better. For sure. A couple more things. You made, a two, you made a Tupac reference earlier, right? Um, you've seen these versus battles online. 
Mm-hmm. And you hear all the speculation. If there was a versus between Tupac and Biggie, who's going to win that battle? Biggie. Biggie? Biggie. Yeah, Biggie. Yeah, Biggie. Biggie, it's easy because he had – I heard a – dude, I'm a hip-hop head. I yeah. mean, I've been one since I was eight, nine years old. My first rap, you know, uh, experiences, hip-hop experiences were like – Biz Marquis, um, The Treacherous Four, uh, Public Enemy. So, like, I've been on hip-hop since forever, right? And so, like, Biggie, his flow is better. I think Tupac had the passion and the desire and the feel of that time because at that time we were all kind of worked up about some things. Yeah. And so Tupac, that raspiness in his voice was like, yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, it was raw, and it was like uh, he's speaking something to me. Uh, however, I think at the end of the day, lyricism it goes a long way in my flowing. Uh, I could, I probably don't want to act like a hip hop snob, but I probably will. In that, uh, I don't even think that. I mean, it's gonna be controversial, so be ready for this thing to blow up. <laughs> I don't even think those two are the two greatest of all time. To be honest with you. Yeah, they're two of the more two of the most popular of all time. But not Very easy, easily. Yeah. Most yeah. popular, that's easy. That's easy. But uh, out of the two, I think Biggie wins because he, that East Coast flow is so much smoother, so much more well thought out, so much more eclectic and yeah. cadence, all that. Like I said, I don't want to be a hip hop nerd, but I kind of yeah. am. No, it makes sense. It's a good breakdown. You know, there's no wrong answer. It's your opinion. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I just feel like. I feel like when I get my opinion by anything, people are like, oh, brother. Yeah, yeah. There he goes. So, yeah. Look, as long as you can break down and back up your opinion, then, yeah. then, then it's all right. good for me. I'm not, I'm not okay. hating on anything. Yeah, you're right. good. <laughs> you know, I'm a Tupac fan. It Don't get me wrong, man. You could throw on a Tupac song, and I could probably word for word it. Yeah. Uh, because Biggie's catalog wasn't as extended, extensive. Uh, Pac had more records. But he didn't have as many. Uh, he had some, like, you know, uh, underground stuff, but, yeah. you know, stuff that was actually put out there. He didn't have as much as Tupac. So, And I, li- and I listened to a lot of his feature. Like, Tupac's featuring was yeah. fantastic. Like, yeah, it was. you get – there's, this, uh, there's this, this group called the Funky Aztecs, right? Because mm-hmm. back in the day, we were all into La Raza and all that, right? And so there was this group called the Funky Aztecs, a bunch of Mexican-American guys rapping. In one song, they have uh, they have Tupac featured, and it was like, whoa, what? They got Tupac yeah. on their track, mm-hmm. like not like now where everybody's featured on everything. Yeah, it, it was just it blew my mind. I was like, dang, Tupac's down for the cause, like yeah, <laughs> you know, or whatever, right? So yeah. like, I got That's a lot of love for Tupac just for that. You know, I'm just glad we had this conversation. My wife's on the way back from work because uh, <laughs> she would have broke this computer if she heard you say Biggie <laughs> over Tupac. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. <laughs> Oh, man, we'll stay away from that one again. Yeah. Um, last one, you know, talk about something impactful, some impactful moments that you've had in your career uh, where you realize that what we do is much more than just coaching the game of basketball. It goes much deeper than that. Oh, man. I mean, there's been multiple. Uh, but I guess the greatest one is coaching my brother, man. Like, being able to coach him from the time he was four uh, then I jumped on staff. He went, He graduated from Holy Cross in 07. I jumped on staff there for a couple years. I uh, was able to finish up with him there. Uh, that means everything to me because my brother is my best friend, other than my wife, other than you, babe. Um, he He's my best friend, man. I mean, he's like, he's uh, he's everything to me. So, like, to have been a part of that, it it just... I don't know. I wasn't coaching at when I started coaching my brother and his friends. And even through that time, I wasn't coaching to necessarily like hone my craft, uh, be the greatest at anything. I just wanted to be around and what I thought I knew. Cause we always look back and think, well, I knew something then, but I have to compare it to what I know now. It's laughable. Yeah. Uh, but i have just, I'd look back and I, and I think about the time with him. It's irreplaceable. I mean, I was, I had, I had opportunities to go play college ball and stuff like that, but because of him and my little sister, they didn't want to be away from home. 
Mm-hmm. Because for me, an opportunity to play college ball meant you have to go to New Mexico. Uh, you have to go somewhere in you know, Nebraska. You got to go far away. Yeah. And I just wasn't willing to be away from family. His family has always meant that much to me. And so basketball, as it relates to like the genesis, the why, all that started with my brother and my dad. And so like the moments in between, uh, be- between now and then, uh, were all as a result of my dad and my brother. And my mom was a great basketball player too. She came out, her and my dad graduated from Lanier, right? Mm-hmm. And my mom got schol- a scholarship to play basketball. Uh, not that she ever taught me anything other than to like foul hard and scratch, but uh, <laughs> she did teach me how to work hard. So yeah, I mean, basketball to me is about family. It's no, always it's been that way. It'll always be that way. It'll never not be that. It's always going to be about family. I love it. Well, Mike, I appreciate you, brother. I appreciate your time. Oh, thank you, appreciate man. your insight and, and, and especially on, on the Tupac and Biggie situation. <laughs> <laughs> man, that, that's a, that was a loaded question. I don't know why I jumped. I should have thought more about it. It just, I, always have, I, always have a, uh, I always have an opinion, first of all, but I always have an opinion about hip hop. Like, I always have that opinion. I didn't plan on asking it, just to be honest. It just popped in my head as uh, you said that Tupac quote there. I said, you know what? Let me ask somebody this yeah. question. You know. yeah. But I appreciate you, man. I appreciate your time, brother. And if you need likewise. something along the way, you know, feel free to reach out. Yeah, likewise, man. I appreciate you so much for doing this. All the coaches that have been on, uh, if you're watching, man, I respect all of you. Uh, I love what you guys do. I've been a fan of most of you. Some of you, I don't know you. Uh, continue what you do for kids, first of all. The city, younger guys are watching. Uh, there's some people that you've had on your podcast, brother, that I used to sit behind their bench and just watch them. Mm-hmm. Didn't even care about the game. I wanted to see how they, uh, what they did, you know. I wanted to see how they reacted, how they responded. Timeouts, what are they going to say? What are they going to do? Mm-hmm. So close that I could hear what they were saying. So close that I could see what they were drawing up. Yeah. John Valenzuela comes to mind. Oh, he was yeah. one guy that I studied, man. Like, I studied that dude. Yep. You know, and uh, so, yeah, just coaches out there, keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you do for the kids, for your communities, especially right now. This time right now is so important that we uh, carry a torch for our communities and the schools that we serve and the kids that we serve because they're confused about a lot of things. Yeah. We're confused about some things, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, and just continue to serve and serve with your heart, serve with your time, serve with your sweat. And, uh, and all good things will come to you. So, Mar- Marcus, I really do appreciate it, brother. I really do. I appreciate you, my man. You have a good day. Stay healthy. Stay safe. And uh, sure. man, continue those barbecues at home, bro. Oh, man. You better believe it. All right, brother. <laughs> we'll talk soon. Yes, sir. Bye-bye.